Welcome, High Flyers, to the Aim High Podcast. I am your host, Bud Evans. Today, we are with Matt Pacheni. He is a real estate investor, a coach, a number one best-selling author, and not one, but a two-time Tony Award winner. We'll dive into his book, Backstage Guide to Passive Investing, and unlock his secrets of real estate. With his unique blend of expertise, Matt is the perfect mentor for your investing journey. You can get to know him better on LinkedIn. Stay tuned to where we provide real estate investors the tools to achieve generational wealth. Welcome to the Aim High Podcast. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Aim High Podcast. Today, I am here with Matt Pacheni. How are you today, Matt? I'm doing well. How are you? I am fantastic. We both love the Foo Fighters. We have already exchanged that information. Listen, here's a couple of things. Passive income investing, real estate investor, coach, and you want a Tony? Two, actually. <laughs> Listen, I, so here's the thing. You and I have spoken already, but I want you to give a please. Give me an introduction so that those who are listening or watching on YouTube can find out exactly who you are. Yeah, I started, I moved to New York City to go to college. I went to a musical theater conservatory and studied musical theater and was a musical theater performer for five years. Actually did not win a Tony back then, really wanted to, but didn't quite make it. But yeah, I, I was a working actor. I did a lot of shows regionally and it did some tours and international and it was great. I started tinkering around with computers as a hobby that led into actually creating my own boutique agency. I'm talking about the mid to late 90s here, doing website development in New York City. 2001 came along, the dot-com bubble burst, and my business imploded. Everyone was just not spending money or going out of business. And I, it was a really tough time for me. And at that time, I also got a call from my landlord who told me I had 90 days to get out of the apartment that I was living in. I was, what the heck am I going to do? I wanted to still live in New York City, but without a job and without a business that had any income, how was I going to make this work? What I ended up doing was getting a job at Showtime, the television cable channel. They were a client of mine. They offered me a position in-house. So I went in-house there. And instead of renting an apartment, I actually bought an apartment. It wasn't where I wanted to live. It was way uptown, but it was something that I could buy and afford. And about two, a little over two years later, I sold that apartment and I more than quadrupled my down payment, my initial investment in the deal. And I was like, whoa, how do I do that again? I was making a very good salary at that point in time, but that one transaction was more than a year's worth of salary for me. So I was like, I got to figure this thing out. And that's what set me on the path excuse me, that's what set me on the path to where I am today. I did real estate as a hobby for about 10 years, doing some fix and flips and little things here and there. And about seven years ago, I started doing real estate full-time. And that is now my full-time job. And I syndicate multifamily apartment deals. And in my spare time, my wife and I sometimes will get together and co-produce Broadway shows. I still have that passion for the theater, but that's my wife's full-time job. She works in the theater industry on the business side of Broadway. And once in a while, we'll, we'll join forces and do some stuff. And we've been fortunate enough that a couple of the shows that we've been involved with won Tony Awards. So we have a couple of Tonys. That's awesome. Not one, but two. They're tough to come by already, but... That's fantastic. And jumping into real estate, so it, that, that first apartment sparked your, gave you that spark to really jump into it. But what was your first deal besides that? So the first ever real estate deal was a primary residence. And then the next thing, so once we sold that apartment, I sold it and I bought an apartment now in a desired part of town where I wanted to live. And about a year later, just through circumstances, I ended up buying my first real investment property. I had, would still do website development. I was working in digital marketing, but not really doing website for my own clients. But I did some moonlighting here and there. And I had a little bit of money saved up that I wanted to put into something. And a very good friend of mine, one of my best friends, her father was a real estate broker in Connecticut. And he needed a website. 
And he said, hey, can you do a website for me? Well, we used to go up and visit up there, we'd get out of the city for a nice weekend up in the country. So we used to go up there once in a while. So we were up there and he said, hey, I'd love to talk with you about a website. He said, I wanted to, I want to take you around this area where we do a lot of business. And I went around and was looking. And it was like a really great area. Uh, it was a, a whole community with a lake and a clubhouse and a pool and like an Olympic sized pool, at eight tennis courts. And it was like really nice. And I was blown away. I was like, wow, this is amazing. And he was showing me houses that they had sold, houses that they had with clients that were like under construction. And then there was a couple of vacant lots that he had. He pointed those out. And so I was like, hey, just out of curiosity, like how much does one of those lots cost? And he told me the price. And I was like, it was very affordable, especially compared to New York prices. It was just a piece of, it was almost an acre, but it was raw land. It just had trees all over it. And here I was thinking I'm a big shot because I had already done that one deal and quadrupled my money, right? In two years, why can't I do that again? Which did not happen. But I ended up buying that property. I bought the land. And a few years later, I actually built the house on the land. So I really learned about real estate, like literally from the ground up. I mean, knocked down trees, dug a hole, poured a foundation, the whole nine yards, and ended up using that house as a rental. Because as the house was getting done being built, I was thinking it would be more of a vacation home. I met this girl who, spoiler alert, is now my wife. And her family had a place in Connecticut on the other side of the state. So once the house was actually built, I, just, I rented it out. So I learned a lot about renting and the fun tax stuff that you have to do and bookkeeping and depreciation, all that fun stuff. And that, that was really my first investment property. Awesome. So now you've been doing this a bit, right? So have you ever had anything, because I'm dealing with one right now that's an absolute nightmare, but have you ever had a, a negative experience in the real estate industry? Yeah, I've had many negative, many negative experiences, but I think that overall the positive definitely outweighs them. But and you can run into all kinds of situations, especially in with, with people, anytime you're dealing with people, that can be difficult, and especially with their living situation. So tenants sometimes can be difficult, but they're our customer. So the customer is always right. We got to work with them, but sometimes they can be challenging and difficult. And sometimes other people that we're buying properties from or selling properties to, they can be challenging. So yeah, I think that's just life in general. But yeah, the business can definitely be challenging. Yeah, 100%. What do you rely on when you get into a situation like that? Is there a technique, a trick? Do you have a team? How do you get out of net your bad situations? I think each situation is different. I think that I'm a good creative problem solver. When I worked in the advertising business, so after my business imploded, I spent 18 years working in digital marketing at a number of agencies throughout New York City. And I ultimately became a PMI certified project management professional, which just means that I'm really good at managing people, budgets, and timelines. And so in that experience of 18 years dealing with clients and also our own staff and different personalities and things like that, I've learned how to, I think, take a look at a situation, assess a situation, and hopefully come to the table with a win-win solution for all parties involved. And that's what I try to do as best as I can. I've got a great team behind me on all the things that I work on. We have a local third-party property management for all of the properties that, that we acquire. They're really our first line of, of defense, if you will, helping resolve all of those problems. And then I have partners that I work with that have different expertise. And so we can all rely on each other and figure out ways to, to resolve the issues that come up. Excellent. Thank you. And great point. One of the things that I try to get across on this podcast and to my students is that the majority of everything that you do in this business, it's all about networking. And the more people you have in your corner, the better off you'll be in the long run. So that that was perfect, man. Thank you very much. My sure. follow-up question was going to be, how did you get out of it? But you nailed it. So I appreciate that. <laughs> and I appreciate the insight. Thanks. So what average size are you buying right now? When you're doing your syndications, are you in the large yeah. scale? Are you in the medium scale, like 50 to 100 or bigger? Yeah, we're in the larger scale, usually in the 200 to 300 range. And a lot of times we're purchasing properties as a portfolio. 
So like our latest deal is almost 700 units. It's across three different properties that we're buying as a package. So we've done that a number of times. I think actually when I think about it, about 80% of the properties that we have acquired have been some sort of portfolio package. And in the earlier days, I would buy two 60 unit properties within a mile or two of each other. Now it's okay. Now I'm buying three 200 unit properties. But a lot of times it's been packages. Once in a while, we'll get a one off 184 unit property that we'll take down or 200 unit property we'll take down. Excellent. And when you're, when you're doing these syndications, are you using a fund? Do you have people that you deal with the majority of the time? Accredited, non-accredited? What's your pool? Yeah, we deal with both 506B and 506C deals. So with the 506B, we can have up to 35 sophisticated that are not accredited. But with the 506Cs, when we do those, like the, my latest deals on 506C, it's accredited people. Because it's 506C, we don't have to have that pre-existing relationship with them, which is nice. But the vast majority of the people that I invest with, I have a pre-existing relationship with. I work hard to build an investor database of people that I do have that pre-existing relationship with so that if we were to choose to do a 506B, I can market it to them as well as others. Obviously, with the 506C, they have to be accredited. But what I found is that most of my investors are accredited. I've never had a 506B deal where I've maxed out on the 35 that you can have that are non-accredited. That's mainly where I'm getting my investors from is that investor. I've created an investor club. So I have a large email list of people who are interested in me and get my monthly newsletter that I send out. It's got like tons of great investing tips and educational material and all that. But within that, there is a subset of people, but about 25% of the people that are, have chosen to join my investors club um, in which I've had meeting and a prerequisite to be in the club is to have a meeting with me. And we talk about your finances and your financial goals and things of that nature. And that's where the investors come from. Excellent. And now, so you, you started with an apartment, you won a couple of Tonys, now you're syndicating three, six, 700 deals at a time, 700 units at a time. What's on the horizon? Where do you go from here? I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. I really like what I'm doing right now, but one of the things that I have done is I've started helping people who want to do the same thing that I do. So I'm doing some coaching in that space. But beyond that, I'm just continuing to do the theatrical stuff when it's right. My wife does a lot of those on her own too, but once in a while we'll team up together. So I still do that when it's the right thing that I feel passionate about. But I'm more interested in, in, in the real estate and continuing to find really good opportunities for people that are interested in generating passive income. They're, they're deals that I want to do, but I just can't do them on my own because I don't have $10 million of capital that I can just deploy. But if I can get a bunch of people to come along with me on that ride, make them a lot of money and, and do myself as well. Excellent. Yeah, and like I said, it's all about getting together with people. In my opinion, this is fun. Yeah. Whether you're coaching or you're capital raising or whatever the case may be, I just enjoy reaching out and having those conversations. Yeah, it's great. And with that PMI certification that I have, I'm really good on the asset management. So I'm involved in that very heavily because I'm good at managing people budgets and timelines. And so I enjoy doing that kind of stuff and just making sure that the investments are performing the way that they should. Um, so yeah, it's been, it, I enjoy my life. I have to say it, it was a tough road to get to where I am. I've had a lot of challenges. I've had a lot of things to learn. I've had to take some risk and just go for it, but it's worked out pretty well. So I'm pretty happy with that. Excellent. So what is one thing you learned as your wealth increased? Was there a specific takeaway? I... There's been so many things that I've learned along the journey. I don't know if there's one just in terms of the wealth increasing. The I have tried to, especially in the past several years, add value, not just in the sense of, oh, we're going to do a value add strategy on a property or we're making improvements and that's called a value add. But what I've been trying to do is add value to people. 
Well, so one of the things is on our properties where it's really important to me that we're not just making something look nice and increasing rent, but actually making it a better place to live for the residents. We do a lots of things for the residents. I could talk, we could do a whole podcast episode about the types of things that we're doing at the properties to make lives better for the residents there. Also want to treat our staff really well, the people that work there and make money for our investors. So we do all of that, but also trying to just add value through, especially with my presence online. Like I'm just trying to help people make connections if I can. If I know somebody's looking for something and I know someone who has that to offer, giving out free educational material. I have a book that's for sale because it costs money to print the book and everything. But like on my website, I have about 30 articles now that are like detailed articles about real estate type subjects that are just up there for free. And I find the more value that I put out there, the more I try to connect people, the, it, it ends up coming back around, maybe like pokey sounding or whatever. But I do find that the more I give and the more I try to put out there and help people, the more it boomerangs back to me, which is something that I like. So continue to do that. Hey, Matt, the more I'm sitting here and I'm finding myself leaning forward, I have this tendency to do that when we're recording the podcast, recording the show, because I'm, I just get so interested in the things that, that you're saying that I'm just like, I'm just leaning in, trying to relax and sit back. But man, it's so exciting listening to what you're talking about and that value add, because it's, you're absolutely right. If you're doing that, people will gravitate to you, especially in this industry, right? I think so. That's how it's worked out for me so far. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Matt, we're going to go into the soaring four. These are the same four questions that we ask every guest that can help someone who is getting into the business achieve new heights. Okay. Right, so question number one, what do you use to keep yourself motivated? My desktop is a picture of me and my wife and my two girls, and that keeps me quite motivated. Excellent. What is one thing that you learned along this journey that has completely changed your mindset? Probably the, the value add thing that I was talking about before and just hearing about abundance mentality versus the scarcity mentality. I think before I got involved in the real estate world, I was very much coming from a, not like in a negative way, but I just, I think my outlook was a little bit more from a scarcity mindset and, and having that abundance and that there's plenty in the world for everybody has, I think, changed my perspective on a lot of things. Yeah. There are always crumbs from the cookie, aren't there? It's just yeah. everybody can take a bite. What tools do you use to keep yourself on track? I am just about to start with something new because I want to start using some project management software because the tasks are becoming too much. I used to use my inbox and calendar, which is fine for one person. But now that I've got a team, I think we're going to start implementing, actually, it's on my list for next Monday to discuss with my team about deploying a project management software. We're going to look into Trello, Asana, Basecamp, and Monday.com. Those are four project management software and collaboration type tools that, that I'm familiar with. We'll figure out what we think is going to be the best for us to use. Yeah, excellent. We gravitated. We moved towards Asana, Trello, Asana. They're relatively similar, all of them. So great. And then last thing is, what's one thing you'd change if you had to start all over? I don't want to have any, I don't really have any regrets, but had I known about real estate and the power of passive investment and the ability to syndicate, I didn't know syndication was a thing until six years ago. If I would have known that in my 20s, Maybe I would have, I don't know, my, in my, in, for most of my 20s, I was a starving, not, I don't want to say starving, but struggling actor. I didn't have money to invest in deals. But once I started my own business, I could have socked away money and invested in things like, like the, again, no regrets. Like the property that I talked about, the Connecticut property that I had purchased and built the land and all of that. Again, hindsight, that was not a good move. That, financially, I learned a lot from it. But if I had taken that, those money and invested that in syndications and just kept rolling that over, I'd be in a much better financial position now. I'm okay financially, but I'm just saying I have a lot more wealth had I started way back then. Are you ready to take your real estate investments sky high? Aim High REI is the perfect Facebook community for you. 
Get answers from experienced investors, connect with other motivated individuals, and benefit from valuable resources all in one place. If that sounds like something that interests you, join our amazing network today and we'll help elevate your investing journey beyond what you think is possible. Aim High REI is on Facebook. Just click the link down in the show notes. The best part, it's completely free to join. I help new real estate investors overcome the fear of failure and achieve generational wealth through buying rental properties. Go to BudEvans.com and book a call with me to find out why we guarantee your first rental property. Thanks. Now back to the show. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's fantastic. The, I just look at it and go, if I knew then what I know now, how much yeah. more would you have? But yeah. Matt, if someone wanted to reach out to you, how would they go ahead and do that? The oh, best way to reach out to me is through my website. It's Pacheni.com. And I'll spell it because it's a weird last name, but it's P like in Peter, I C H E N Y dot com. I, I highly recommend people go there. I have tons of free resources for you to read or download. You can find out about the book or anything about me through the website. Fantastic. And we'll make sure that is in the show notes. Matt, thank you very much. I wish you increased happiness and health and growth in your, in your ventures. So really, and man, kill it with the Tonys. I love Broadway. I live an hour and a half South. We go up there at least once or twice a year or so. Good luck. But you're going to have to let me know the next time that you're in town. And thanks so much for having me as a guest on your show. Likewise. Absolutely. Will do. Thank you very much. And for those of you listening on the podcast or watching on YouTube, until next time we meet, aim high.